commentator is James Coy. At Cairo, within shadow of the ancient pyramids where Rommel's African offensive was crushed, the fate of Japan is resolved by China, the United States, and Great Britain. Prime Minister Churchill confers with Madame Chiang Kai-shek, who attends the conference as interpreter for her husband, China's Generalissimo. Here, for the first time, Chinese, American, and British plan their strategy on a unified basis for future thrusts at Nippon, thrusts to eventually seal Japan's fate. From Egypt, the war meetings shift to the heavily guarded Soviet embassy in Iran, where Russia's Joseph Stalin makes his military debut on foreign soil. He joins President and Prime Minister to plan present and future strategy against Hitler and his aggressor allies. Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Prime Minister's daughter, Sarah Churchill Oliver, of the WAAF attend. President Roosevelt introduces Mrs. Oliver to Stalin. Then follows an historic ceremony. The Prime Minister presents Marshal Stalin with a sword of honor, a gift from his sovereign to the heroic people of Stalingrad. The President admires the symbol of solidarity. Your commentator is Ray Hanley. The hard road to Tokyo. An American armada laden with United States Marines steams ahead to Tarawa. Before the dawn of battle, chaplains lead our men in prayer. Then from the peace of prayer, the roar of battle ensues. The seas are peppered with gunfire to protect our vessels from lurking enemy submarines. First, our warships unleash a tremendous pre-landing bombardment. Then thousands of rounds of ammunition are loaded into barges. The first wave of attacking Marines starts toward shore in amphibious tractors and landing boats under a terrific naval barrage to shield them from enemy fire. Thousands of tons of aerial bombs are rained upon Tarawa's waterfront and beachhead as the shore lights up like the crack of doom. On come our heavily manned landing craft as naval gunfire mounts to an unbelievable crescendo of thunder, smoke, and fire. The Marines press on toward shore, unaware that the coral reef that skirts Tarawa will not allow close landing. Landing boats are abandoned as the Marines are forced to wade ashore under terrific crossfire from Jap machine gunners and snipers. Our first assault battalions are cut to ribbons, but wave after wave of Marines continues to land and forge ahead to battle down the strongly entrenched enemy. Here in a veritable no man's land, 4,000 Imperial Jap Marines fight to the last against our oncoming leathernecks. Here, at an appalling cost of life, our men seek to wrest this all-important island from the enemy, who seized it from a few missionaries and natives shortly after the Jap sneak attack on Pearl Harbor. Jap pillboxes are blown up, along with the enemy's permanent concrete gun shelters, sunken 20 feet into the ground. The shell-shattered terrain is strewn with enemy casualties. On every hilltop, Japs are entrenched, ready and waiting for the assault, holed in a bomb-proof shelter. 
pouring an incessant rain of steel from their stronghold. A flamethrower goes into action. Japs in a pillbox are trapped and destroyed. landing boats, bringing reinforcements, race through the choppy sea to land on the beachhead as the intensity of the battle increases. On the second day, the battle reaches its venomous height. Back in the island's desolate waste, our men wage the grimmest battle the Marines have ever fought. The wounded receive constant care as stretcher bearers hurriedly return the maimed and suffering behind the battle lines for emergency treatment and life-giving plasma. And here in the thick of battle, a fearless cameraman photographs a stirring and dramatic episode. Another concrete enemy pillbox is discovered, a sunken fortification from which the Japs snipe many a brave Marine. Cautiously, the Marines stalk the enemy with guns held in readiness. But the guns and hearts of all but one of the trapped Japs have been still. For three days and three nights, the battle rages, a battle that ranks with the most bitter and concentrated engagements in all American military history. Crosswire sweeps the trees like a tropical hurricane. Millions of bullets, hundreds of tons of explosives pour into the stubborn Japanese. Every yard of Jap position is raked by fire and shot. United States gunfire is ceaseless, and here in the heat of battle, we see a group of frightened, terror-stricken Japs rushing to a safe haven, which they never attain. Admiral Hill and Marine General Smith, who led the attack. As the crescendo of battle lessens, a frightened kitten, the only living thing for acres around, emerges into the light, and a battle-scarred Marine meekly shares his canteen with a helpless creature. This smiling Marine exhibits a near miss. Tarawa is won, but the record is grim. 1,026 gallant Marines will never return. 2,557 are wounded. The price of victory was high and might have been greater had not the heroism of the attacking Marines overcome the unexpected waterfront hazards that took such a devastating toll. The surviving men returned to the shore carrying their wounded. Others marched to camp over the shattered sand dunes and beneath the shell-raked coconut palms, out of the holocaust of war, into the warmth of a tropical sun. Tarawa was impregnable, the Japs claimed, but they forgot to tell it to the Marines. Grim faces past Lieutenant Colonel Arnold Johnston, who salutes his surviving comrades. At Guadalcanal, the United States Marines first raised old glory on enemy soil, and now at Tarawa, they unfurl our symbol of victory, a victory second to none in the annals of courage, daring, and heroism, always faithful to the traditions of their corps and their country. <laughs>